वेलकम बैक दी नेक्स्ट स्पीकर इज नारायणन कृष्णन नारायणन ही इज एन एसोसिएट प्रोफेसर इन द डिपार्टमेंट ऑफ डेटा साइंस आई आई टी पालक्कड नारायणन विल गिव थ्री लेक्चर्स दोज विल बी ऑन मशीन लर्निंग एंड होप यू ऑल विल एंजॉय इट thank you partha uh, i hope i am audible right okay so i have a problem with my specs because i need my specs to actually see what is on my screen but if i wear my specs all of you appear very vague and they are very blurry pictures so i'll try to juggle with both um thank you vishu partha sudeepta for uh, giving me this opportunity to participate in this uh, you know i'll call it a school right um Uh, i have to confess i am not a, a person who works with you know in the area which you are all most familiar with in complex systems non linear dynamical systems i am more a machine learning person and uh, when partha asked me hey can you come and give a talk in this uh, very nice summer school i mean you know summer school right i was very hesitant i mean what can i you know tell you guys teach you guys then we said okay why not talk about machine learning and introduce uh, machine learning to you so my endeavor for today would be to give you um, i mean though the initial title was a gentle introduction to machine learning i removed the word gentle when i actually created the slide deck right so i'll uh, give you a glimpse into what is machine learning and perhaps go slightly deeper into one particular aspect of machine learning which is you know neural networks deep learning or representation learning which is what is currently driving the research in the area of machine learning and you see all these different ai technologies um around you right so they are primarily driven by that particular uh, uh, algorithm so i'll discuss that algorithm in slightly greater detail and introduce you to a couple of other variants of neural networks which has convolutional neural networks and recurrent neural networks so that would be my agenda so agenda for today so before i go back so this picture that you see here this is actually taken from one of your peers work smita's work so um this might be very daunting you see lot of networks and layers etc and my hope is through this lecture i will demystify some of some aspects of it all right so the agenda for today is i'll do a quick introduction to machine learning introduce you to different learning paradigms and the general machine learning architecture okay so what how can we um break down you know any machine learning algorithm the three main steps so that's what i'll first talk about following which i will hopefully spend a good amount of time discussing feed forward networks which are multi layer perceptrons or neural networks uh which are the precursors of modern day deep neural networks i will talk about perceptron the building block of a neural network a multi layer perceptron the architectural considerations when you are constructing a multi layer perceptron then the fundamental algorithm which is used to train a neural network which is the back propagation algorithm and some of the practical issues and challenges that one faces while training neural networks and how does one handle it some tricks of the trade so to say right and hopefully in the afternoon session we can talk about convolutional neural networks how does it differ from you know your classical deep neural networks or multi layer perceptrons and a variation of neural networks for handling sequences could be time series or in general any sequences which is recurrent neural networks okay so this is the agenda for today so let's get started with the first topic which is introduction to machine learning 
how many of you are exposed to machine learning let me ask you that question because just by show of hands okay that is very interesting all right so what do you think is machine learning you would have seen various ai technologies around you right you may be using a smartphone uh, you know google assistant or you might be using siri or uh, you might be having a netflix account and you see it recommends you you watch this movie you watch this tv show and all right so have you i mean were you curious to figure out you know what is actually driving these technologies and if you were to look at it you will find out it is basically some machine learning model which is there in the background which is throwing these things at you so what is machine learning right so um, before i have to acknowledge professor biksha raj from kanigi mellon university his course on artificial neural networks and deep learning those of you who are mathematically inclined and come from a signal processing background right so neural networks actually started from a signal processing perspective there were basically electrical circuits and switches right so his course is something that i would always recommend my uh, graduate students to go through so a quick acknowledgement uh, um, from my side so what is machine learning so do you consider this to be a machine learning algorithm so you are familiar with python some kind of programming language right so a company claimed we use machine learning algorithms to greet the user with a personalized message all they are doing is asking the user their input and just tagging or appending hello to their name i mean this is not intelligence right so herbert simon who is one of the father figures of machine learning coined the term machine learning to be any process by which a system improves its performance and over period of time uh, this is tom mitchell's uh, definition and finally the current wikipedia definition which is probably uh, most accurately summarizing the modern day machine learning deep learning networks right so it deals with the construction and study of systems that can learn from data rather than follow any explicitly programmed instructions right so this is what is machine learning just to give you some historical perspective so somewhere in the 80s um there is 80s and early 90s there was an explosion of systems called expert based decision systems or expert systems so there were a bunch of uh, you know rules which were put together looking at you know all possible combinations of input and what will be the corresponding output right so it's just an if and then rule so if you are thinking about a mycene system which was used for helping aiding doctors with medical diagnosis the system was if the patient had you know a temperature above certain thing or and if the patient's uh, uh, bl blood pressure was you know within a particular range and if the patient is having you know diabetes etc etc then perhaps the patient has you know x and y disease the challenge with i mean how who designed these rules it was actually humans who designed these rules looking at you know the situations and context they are involved in but the challenge with these systems were that they couldn't i mean they so to say they were brittle in nature so the moment you throw at this system an observation which was not seen a priori during the training phase so to say right the system failed to give an output it failed miserably because it worked you know just in the previous session which you were saying it worked really well on the data it was exposed to but could not generalize to other unseen environments and modern machine learning techniques actually are designed in such a way that the goal is to improve the performance on that unseen set of instances that is to have high generalizability in the model so there are different learning paradigms and applications so the most popular one is the supervised learning framework as the name suggests it involves some amount of supervision and who provides this supervision well as an end user of the system 
right? You might provide that supervision. An example of such a, a framework is a classification framework, right? So given an image for of you know image containing handwritten digits, you would like to predict what is the number or digit which is present in that image. The input to such a model is the image containing the digit and the supervision is in terms of the label that is associated with that image. So if I look at this particular image, the input is the image and the supervision is the label which is zero. And somebody, perhaps a human, right, went through the effort of looking at every image and labeling it as belonging to one of these 10 classes or one of these 10 digits, right? So classification deals with the problem of mapping an input X that can be in any space to an output, which is discrete, so to say. There is no um, uh, ordinal, uh, I mean, there is no order relationship which you can establish, right? Is they are just numbers zero, one, two. Of course, zero is great, less than one is less than two. I'm not talking in that sense. It can be, you know, classification of objects. One cannot say lion is greater than leopard is greater than cheetah. It doesn't make sense. They are just labels, right? How do you learn a mapping from the input X to that label? That is what is classification. Okay. So the output here is just a set of symbols or labels. Is that clear? Okay. Another example of supervised learning is regression, right? So suppose you're building an app where you want a user to click a picture of the food that they're eating and miraculously the app says, oh, you're going to consume these many calories, right? Or you capture the face image of a person and you want to estimate what is the age of the person. So the fundamental difference between these two is in the output, right? And the difference is, in the previous case, it was just symbols, but in this case, there is order, right? So you have a continuous output. So you have an order relationship, which is defined, right? And that refers to as regression. And you must be, you might be already familiar with the classical linear regression where you have an input, you're trying to fit, and if you're doing linear regression, you're trying to fit a line to get a necessary, you get a specific output Y, right? So that is supervised learning and an example for regression. Any questions so far? Okay. You also have unsupervised learning, where there is no supervision which is provided, right? So if I were to just give you this figure here, which is the famous half moon data set in the machine learning community, by visually looking at this image, you might say, you know, there are distinctly two different groups of data, right? One is the moon, which is above, which is, you know, concave. You have another moon, which is in the bottom, which is in the convex shape, right? The question I ask is, suppose I were to give you only this data, just a distribution of points, can you automatically figure out or can an algorithm automatically figure out there are actually two distinct group of points in it? You're not providing any supervision. There is no label here, right? All you're providing is the data and the algorithm automatically figures out that yes, there are two distinct groups of data. And what are those distinct groups? They're typically referred to as clusters. And that is clustering algorithm. So you have the very classical k-means clustering algorithm where given a data, you assume that the clusters are basically, you know, um, Gaussian distributed. That means they are spherical or ellipsoidal in nature. And the goal is to find how many such clusters or what are those clusters which are present in the data. So that is one example for unsupervised learning. Another example is collaborative filtering, which you would have seen when you um, looked at Netflix or uh, Amazon Prime Video, right? So you have 
um, a bunch of movies. So what does Netflix have? What is the data that Netflix owns or generates from users like us? Our preferences, right? What movies do we like? What TV shows do we like? And we give it a rating, right? So if Netflix says, no, there, there, there was this very popular solid challenge called the 1 million Netflix challenge. This was in 2010 or so, where a 1 million user database was given, where you have 1 million users along the rows, right? And you had a whole bunch of movies and TV shows watched by these 1 million users along the columns. Obviously a person cannot watch everything, right? You would watch, a subset of those movies, probably a subset of those TV shows. And for those, you know, TV shows and movies that you watch, you may have a rating from one to 10. So imagine this sparse matrix, right? Where along the rows are the users, viewers, along the columns are the TV shows, or movies. And the entry in this matrix is basically a user's rating of a particular movie or TV show. This is what the data that Netflix owns, right? Or it generates. I don't know if they own, I mean, so to say, but this is what they generate. And their goal is, given this, can we now identify you know, what kind of movies or TV shows a particular user will like so that they can recommend it to them, All right? And that is where collaborative filtering comes to. And the basic algorithm there is a matrix factorization. So given this non-negative matrix, because a user rating is always between one and 10. So it's a non-negative matrix. You factorize it into you know, two matrices, A and B, where A is a matrix which establishes the relationship between users and some latent factors which are present in the movies. Like you know the genre of the movie, or um, you know whether it is, uh, a super hit movie, or whether it is a, a black and white movie or a color movie, right? Or if there is a superstar in that movie and so on. I mean, I'm just calling it latent factors because it's hard to figure out what this latent factor actually corresponds to. But this factorization results in these two matrices, which establishes the relationship between user and these latent factors and the latent factors and the movies. And through that process, you can do the recommendations. That is collaborative filtering. Another example for unsupervised learning. Another uh, important learning paradigm is dimensionality reduction. So this was an immensely um, popular paradigm until the advent of deep neural networks and these huge, gigantic computational resources right through GPUs. Just to illustrate to you the principles of dimensionality reduction, right? Suppose I give you an image. What is an image? How can you mathematically abstract an image, represent an image? It's a pixel, right? Yes, it is a set of pixels, but it's just any set of pixels. Yeah, it has a structure to it. What is that structure? Matrix, right? An image is basically, if you look at a grayscale image, it is basically a two-dimensional matrix, right? And if I say, I'm looking at the intensity at the location I comma J, can you make an educated guess about what will be the intensity at I plus one comma J? Yes or no? Yes. More or less, it is going to be the same, right? So basically, there is a lot of redundancy which is present in these images, right? Because you're saying most likely adjacent pixels are going to have the same intensity. So why do I have to consider those adjacent pixels? So they may be a more compact representation of that image, right? To further motivate this example, consider a human face, right? And we are capturing the facial image, okay? And the human face has how many degrees of freedom? Hmm? Three, pitch, yaw, and roll, right? So you can do like this, you can go like this, or you can go like this. That's it, right? 
So if I am capturing a human face at different combinations of these three degrees of freedom, right? From a digital perspective, all you have is an image, right? And if you are using, say, a 5 megapixel camera, how are you representing that image? How many ever pixels are there in that 5 megapixel camera, right? So what, 5 million pixels or so? So you're representing a single face image using 5 million pixels, right? But actually, if you're capturing a human face, you know, with this di different degrees of freedom, how many dimensions do you actually need to represent that image? Just three, right? Which you're enrolled. The rest of the details which are present in the image are not really relevant. Then. Do you get my point? So if your goal is to characterize an image having different pose, that is the you know, combinations of pitch, yaw, and roll, they, it basically corresponds to a point in a three-dimensional space. Yet, because of the process of data capture, I am representing each image as a 5 million pixel entity or a vector. So when you're doing certain operations, you may be interested in reducing the dimensionality of the image from 5 million pixels to just three dimensions. How do you go about reducing these dimensions? To do two things. One, remove redundancy. Second, bring out aspects which are actually relevant to the task that you're trying to do. Right? So that falls under dimensional reduction. So if you're familiar with statistics, you may have come across this in a different way called factor analysis or principal component analysis. So, on. so that is you know, another way to look at dimensionality reduction. There are other very recent learning paradigms which are very popular. So I just thought of listing a few of them. One is transfer learning. That is transfer of knowledge between multiple domains. And the best way I can illustrate it to this audience is, let's say you're an expert in handling temporal systems, okay? And your friend um, has no knowledge about nonlinear dynamical systems. And suddenly both of you are thrown with the task of analyzing spatio-temporal systems. Who do you think will be in a better position to handle the new problem? The one who has knowledge of temporal systems. Why is that so? They can extrapolate it. Another example I'll give you. Are you familiar with C, C++, Java? No. Okay. Um, uh, you know rugby? Yes, you've heard of rugby? Have you heard of American football? Yes? Yeah? So they are very similar sports, right? Rugby and American football are similar sports. American football, uh, they call actual football as soccer, right? So they're very similar sports, meaning a person who has knowledge of, you know, one game can easily extrapolate it and apply it to a new game. If a person knows how to ride a bicycle and a person doesn't know how to ride a bicycle, the person who knows how to ride a bicycle might be more quick in learning to ride a scooter because he, they can transfer that knowledge, what they have gleaned for doing one particular task and apply it to another task. And that is basic transfer learning. How do you build machine learning models which can capture that basic knowledge which is being learned for doing one particular task and apply to a new task. So that is transfer learning. Active learning is a paradigm which is used, you know, especially in the supervised learning context. You should understand that one of the main challenges of supervised learning is it requires large amounts of supervision, which is translated as large amounts of labeled data. And who provides this label data? It is humans, right? So we do the annotation, we go through this effort of annotating the data, and that is a very costly 
process, costly business, right? So how can you come up with efficient strategies to minimize the labeling effort, right? That is basically dealing with active learning. So the annotation process, annotating process, as well as the learning process happen in tandem. They're happening together simultaneously. That is active learning. Then you have online learning where, you know, you don't have all the data available right in the beginning. Data is coming, you know, on the fly in a sequence. So how, and you, perhaps you cannot even store the data. The data comes, you have to look at it, make a call, what to learn, and the data goes away, right? In such a setting, how do you build machine learning models? So that deals with online learning. And a special category, there is zero-shot learning, where uh, you have learned a supervised model, say, to learn polar bear, um, rabbits, horses, and so on, right? And suddenly, at test time, the model is presented with, say, a brown bear image. Will the model be able to predict that it is a brown bear? That means the model is presented with an unseen class instance during test time. And can we enable the model, facilitate the model to predict that it belongs to that particular unseen class? Of course, that requires establishing some kind of relationships between these labels. And that is what is the auxiliary information or semantic information. But that is very interesting because it is able to predict a new class without even seeing an instance of that class. And that is very powerful. And that is what is zero shot learning. Modern day machine learning primarily is based on this, which is representation learning. How do you automatically learn a representation from the raw data? You know, just in the previous lecture, Dr. Guttel was talking about um, autocorrelation, skewness, and certain other properties, which you, as a scientific expert in the domain, figured out, you know, these are the important things that you would like to extract in order to model a certain task. And the goal of representation learning is allowing the model to figure it out what it thinks is important to do a particular task. While that might help it to do a particular task, the downside of it is it remains a mystery to us. What is it learning? Can we physically quantify what it is learning? That becomes a challenging task. And that's why there is a very recent, you know, if you see there is an explosion in an explosion of techniques referred to as explainable artificial intelligence, XAI, right? And there are a whole bunch of techniques which are proposed to actually explain an existing model or incorporate explainability while designing a new model. And that's a very relevant field. In fact, um, if you think about it, you've heard of uh, self-driving cars, right? Autonomous vehicles. It's very common in the US. Now suppose the car you know, meets with an accident. Who's responsible for it? Is that the algorithm? Is that the company? Is that the scientist who designed the algorithm? Is it somebody else who trained that model? Who is responsible for it? Very, very difficult question to answer, and I don't have an answer, right? Similarly, in Europe, uh, they have this GDPR uh, rights, right? Where if you're using an AI system, you know, for assisting in any particular task, one of the mandates is a person, the, the model or the company who has built such a system should also explain how the model arrived at a particular decision. And that's very critical. And we would like to know as humans, right? How did the model come up with a particular output? Just you know, out of curiosity, as you know, Vishu was saying this morning, we may be looking at, you know, so far, a certain set of statistical features. Perhaps we missed out on something else, which if we had known, we could have done a much better job. And we're trying to learn what the model is looking at. So that is about representation learning. And that's the entire field of deep learning. 
And final, uh, you know, learning paradigm which I want to talk about is reinforcement learning, which is learning to act in an environment, which is actually how we have grown as a child. Right? We do things. We see the effect of doing those things. And that helps us to evaluate the consequences of our action, right? And modify or change our behavior. So um, you reinforce your understanding of this environment and the consequences of the actions of your actions on the environment, right? So that is reinforcement learning. So there is no explicit supervision which is provided in the reinforcement learning set. And that in itself is actually a huge ocean of work. All right. So having mentioned all these different learning paradigms under machine learning, if you were to look at how to abstract out you know, any machine learning algorithm, we can actually put it into three steps. First is representation. Which is, how would you like to characterize what you are learning? Okay. So let's say our task is a simple supervised classification, which means you are giving as input some x vector. It can be a continuous vector, it can be a discrete vector. I mean, let's not worry about that. And the output is simple class label. So you're basically learning a function f from x to y, where y is your class label. What is the form of this function? That is what is the representation I mentioned. Is it a line? If you're learning a line, what parameters do you want to learn? How do you parameterize the line? Slope and intercept. Suppose you want to learn a circle. What will be the parameters that you will be interested in? The center and the radius. Suppose it is a square. Again, the center and the length, the side of the square, right? Suppose it is a fourth degree polynomial. It will be the coefficients of that fourth degree polynomial. Suppose you want to learn an extremely complex nonlinear function, like a neural network. It will basically be the parameters or the weights of that neural network. So the first important point is, how do you characterize what is being learned? Once you figure that out, the second step is devise an evaluation function which will measure the goodness of what is being learned. Suppose I were to throw at you a bunch of data points, say n data points, and say I have learned this line with you know certain slope m and intercept c. You would like to measure how good is this line with respect to the data that you have. And ideally, you would like to express the evaluation function in terms of the parameters of the representation that you're trying to learn. Okay. In this case, it would be in terms of the slope and the interceptor. So once you devise an evaluation function, which is in terms of the parameters of the representation that you want to learn, what will be the next step? Simple optimization. You have defined a loss function. The loss function in, is in terms of the variables. So the parameters of the loss function are the parameters of your representation. And the loss function represents the goodness of your fit. And all you have to do then is do some kind of minimization to estimate the best set of parameters. Yes. So if you were to look at any machine learning algorithm, I'm actually making a very sweeping statement, but if you were to look at majority of machine learning algorithms, you will be able to break it down into these three steps. Okay. And what is the first one? Examples of first one, general architecture. It can be decision trees. So you have a tree-like structure on your vector, on your input vector. If it is something like, say, if temperature is greater than, you know, what, 37 degree uh, Celsius, then yes, you have a branch. No, you have another branch. 
If it is yes, then you probably look at blood pressure and branch out further. So in this way, you are actually constructing a decision tree and the decision tree is what is your representation, right? That's your representation. Your architecture can be, the representation can be instances themselves. An example of such a classifier or learner is K nearest neighbors. Given a test data point, you look at what is the nearest neighbor of this test data point. And you make your output based on that nearest point. So there is no other explicit representation. It is just the data itself. It could be Bayesian networks where you have some kind of probabilistic graphical model describing your data, which means you will have to infer the connections, the edges between the different random variables and also estimate the joint or conditional distributions at every node of this probabilistic graphical model, right? So that will be a Bayesian network. Or it could be a neural network, you know? Uh, we'll see neural networks in great detail. It's just basically, you know, and to summarize it, it's an extremely efficient way of representing a highly nonlinear function. It could be support vector machines, which is basically a linear classifier, right? It could be ensembles, that is group of classifiers. It could be Gaussian clusters, if you're doing clustering and so on. So there are various representations one can adapt, adopt while devising a machine learning model. Second, evaluation. So given a model, how do you measure how good is the model, the goodness of the model, right? So you can look at, if you're doing a classification problem, you can compute accuracy. So what, would, what do you think? What does your intuition tell you? What could be accuracy? So given say 100 instances, and let's say each instance can either be zero, labeled as zero or one, or positive or negative, or a positive sentiment or a negative sentiment, right? What would accuracy represent? number of instances for which or the fraction of instances for which the model's prediction matches with the actual ground truth label that was associated with that. Got it? Yes. So that is accuracy. You have other measures like say precision recall, uh, which are used when you have, uh, uh, um, you know, imbalance data set where say if, if you're looking at a simple, um, medical application, right? Cancer versus non-cancer. Your data set might predominantly have non-cancerous patients, right? You have very hand few cancerous patients, right? So a machine learning model, which always predicts not cancer, will have very high accuracy there, right? If, if there are 90%, 90 percentage of your total instances belong to non-cancerous state, and only 10% belongs to cancer estate, a model which constantly outputs, irrespective of what is the input, non-cancerous will have 90% accuracy. But is that a good model? Obviously not, right? So you have much finer measures of evaluation like precision and recall. Um, if you're doing a regression task, you might be familiar with the sum of squared error. And then you have likelihood if you're doing uh, probabilistic modeling, posterior probability, Margin, if you're doing, say, support vector machines. KL divergence, if you're computing the divergence between two distributions, right? Entropy, if you're doing, say, decision tree construction and so on. All right? So these are evaluation measures. And finally, you do optimization. So you can do combinatorial optimization through greedy search. You can do convex optimization, gradient descent, and variance of gradient descent, like Stochastic gradient descent, mini wedge gradient descent, Adam, and so on. Or you can do constrained optimization through linear programming, quadratic programming, quadratically constrained linear programming, and so on. And so on. Or integer programming, and so on. Right? So, this is how one can abstract or summarize a machine learning algorithm. And in today's lecture, we will look at deep learning or another term, deep learning is a very recent term. Previously, it was known as artificial neural networks. 
And this figure that I have here is basically, you know, to give you, to contextualize, you know, where is this deep learning? So you have this outer circle, which is the broad term of AI, artificial intelligence. There is much, much more than deep learning in AI. So you have knowledge representations, logic, planning, scheduling, game search, all this fall under the umbrella of artificial intelligence. One specific branch of AI is machine learning, which is learning through examples, learning from examples. And in machine learning, you have a much narrower field, which is representation learning, where you're trying to learn representations for your data. And deep learning is a further narrowing of that particular area where you are actually trying to build deep neural networks to actually learn that representation. Okay, so in modern day, if you hear deep learning, deep learning, you're basically trying to get a rich representation out of your data. Is that clear? Any questions so far? So far, I have refrained from having any equations or so, but hopefully in the next part, we will get into that. Shall we move forward? Okay. So the next part is about feed forward networks, which are basically doing representation. So we'll begin with perceptron. So perceptron is a, the fundamental building block of any deep neural network. Or rather, let me say, a variant of a perceptron is the building block of modern day neural networks. What is this perceptron essentially doing? It consists of two parts. The first part is basically a linear aggregator. So the perceptron is being provided different inputs. These inputs are weighted in a specific order or using specific set of weights and it is just getting aggregated. Yeah. And onto this aggregation, the basic perceptron applies a thresholding to say whether the perceptron is active or inactive. And the thresholding here is at the level zero. So if the output of this aggregation is greater than zero, then the perceptron is active. If the output of the aggregation is less than or equal to zero, the perceptron is inactive. That's basically what is a perceptron. Okay. Yes, is that clear? Yeah. All right. So this is a basic perceptron. And you can think, right, if you're doing a simple classification task, right, you can envision a perceptron being used to do such a task, right? So my question to you is, what is the shape of that decision boundary, which is separating, say, the classes or the instances which are labeled as one, and the instances which are labeled as minus one. Do you understand my question? Yes. I have two sets of instances. One set of instances have been labeled as one. Another set of instances have been labeled as minus one. And the perceptron is being used for this particular task by saying, if the output of the aggregation is greater than zero, then it belongs to plus one. If it is less or equal to zero, it belongs to minus one. So what is the shape of that geometrical surface which separates the plus one class from the minus one class? It's a hyperplane, right? It's a linear decision boundary. Okay, is that clear to you? Just look at this expression. What do we have here? It's a linear function there, right? So perceptron is basically characterizing a linear surface. In 2D, it's a plane. In 2D, it is a line. In 3D, it is a plane. And in general, arbitrary dimensions, it's a hyperplane, which is separating your two classes. Okay. 
and there are um, so it's basically representing um, a hyperplane decision surface and the decision boundary is where you have w transpose x is equal to zero that is the inner product between the weight vector and the input vector is zero right and the data sets which can be separated by such hyperplanes or linear functions linear surfaces is referred to as linearly separable data sets and these are the most easiest set of data sets to ever handle because all you have to learn is a linear function right yeah and there are um, you know there is a very efficient rule or an algorithm to actually learn the perceptron so what does it mean to say learning the perceptron can anyone guess the weights right so the weights are what we want to learn how do you learn those weights well there is an algorithm called the perceptron update rule i won't go into the details of it but rest assured there is a mechanism by which you can learn these weights okay given a set of instances which we call as the training set you can learn what are these wis all right even the yes the perceptron will say it doesn't know it neither belongs here nor it belongs there but typically what we do is we say that if it is greater than 0 it belongs to plus 1 else it is minus 1 so in which case we will say it as minus 1 yes well yeah in this case yes. so you are talking about the sign function right sign function right yeah is that clear yeah okay so this perceptron was for quite some time you know great attraction to um, electrical engineers the perceptron is actually invention is coming from electrical engineering circuits and switches but soon they realized you know ah huh, Correct. Right. Hmm. Correct. But I have multiple data points, right? So what you are saying is with respect to one equation, right? Right. But I ha I need to have the same weight vector to do well for different data points so the weight vector doesn't change depending on the input data point the best fit solution unique solution may not even exist the solution may not the ideal solution may not even exist because if the data is not linearly separable and there might be infinite solutions as well right so for example if i just look at this data set three positive points and three negative points there are infinite number of lines which are actually separating these two but i'm just looking at one such line which actually gives me a good result no no even best fit there are infinite number of lines among them if i can get even one that is okay right how do i get that well there is a perceptron update rule let's not worry about it for now because that's not the focus because even though it is so simple and you know seems to do a good job there is a fundamental limitation and that is it is linear in nature right and if i have to build again going back to the origins they were trying to build classical boolean functions through neural networks through perceptrons you can use a perceptron to represent an and function or an or function or a not function but you cannot represent xor function it can represent many boolean functions but cannot represent xor function because xor function is non linear 
zero 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 one 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 zero one 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 zero. So if you look at these four corners, you will have one red uh, blue color here, and this will be a red. So you, a single line cannot separate the blue circles from the red circle. Are you able to visualize that? Let me see if I have. If not, I'll draw it again. I think I missed. I, I have a wrong picture here. Is that clear to you? That XOR function is a nonlinear function and you know, a, a linear line cannot, I mean, line cannot separate the two classes there. That is a zero class and one class. So that's a fundamental limitation of a perceptron. Yeah, okay. So what they said, we can start stacking these perceptrons together. And that results in the feed forward network, which is multi-layer perceptrons. That means you have input followed by a set of perceptrons, which are connected in a specific way to the input, which is followed by another set of perceptrons and another set of perceptrons and so on and so on. Finally, you have the output. So that builds your multi-layer perceptrons. And there is Hornick's theorem, which is a fundamental theorem, which says that multi-layer perceptrons are universal function approximators. That is, you take any function, you will be able to approximate it or represent it using a multi-layer perceptron. That is its powerful nature. Okay, when I can give you a um, uh, you know an intuitive idea behind it. It's just that uh, you can represent different kinds of shapes using this perceptron. Okay, a single perceptron, and then you combine these perceptrons together, and you can come up with arbitrary shapes which will represent these different functions. Okay, so multi-layer perceptrons are universal function approximators. And the multi-layer perceptrons that we will deal with are referred to as the feed-forward network model. The fundamental difference being the choice of this thresholding function. While perceptrons, as one of you pointed out, was using the sine function of the signum function, for feed-forward networks, we replace it by a generic nonlinear activation function. Okay, so you have the inputs, which are weighted and aggregated by the linear aggregator. The output of the aggregator is passed through this nonlinear activation function, which finally gives you the output. And now you can think of multiple such, you know, nonlinear activated perceptrons being connected together in a stacked fashion, and that becomes your feed forward net. I'll quickly give you know, an example to understand this. So my input is a d-dimensional vector, okay? x0, x1, I mean, d plus one dimensional vector, but I'm just going to say it as a d-dimensional vector, okay? This is my input. The z, the z's that you see here, that is your perceptron net with some kind of nonlinear activations, okay? So we will refer to this as the first hidden layer. It is hidden because you don't explicitly observe it, right? All you observe from the network is you're passing some inputs and you get certain outputs. The outputs are what are the observables. What the internal representations of the networks are not observable to you and you can't even make sense of it, like what exactly it is, right? So that's why these are called the hidden layer nodes or hidden layer neurons. And if I look at the hth hidden layer node, this node is connected to the inputs. And the weight of this connection is represented as W superscript one subscript JH indicating that is the weight of the connection from the input layer to the first hidden layer and 
it is the weight connecting the jth input node to the hth hidden node. Is that clear? Yeah? Okay. So you can imagine this zh getting inputs from each of these d dimension um, uh, d inputs, right? Multiplying it by the corresponding weights, summing it up, which is what you see the term inside this parenthesis. On to that, this node is applying the nonlinear activation function f superscript one. What could be this nonlinear activation function? I'll explain to you in a few minutes. So it is performing some operation on this aggregated, linearly aggregated output. And that is the activation for this hth hidden. Yes? But the network doesn't stop there. This is your hidden nodes, and this is further connected to the outputs. Yes? So at the next level, we have connections from the hidden layer nodes to the output nodes. And in this case, I'm considering a simple example of a two layer network. When I say two layer, it means I have an input layer and a hidden layer, okay? Or I can say just a one layer network where that one actually refers to the number of hidden layers that you have, okay? So the hidden layer is also connected to the output layer and you have weights associated with those connections. So you have W, superscript 2 representing that set of weights and if I look at specifically the kth output right I have whk to represent the weight connecting the hth hidden layer node to the kth output layer yes and once you have this linear aggregation the output layer node can also apply some kind of activation is that clear? And eventually you get the final output, which is O subscript K. If you were to do a regression task, right, where you would like your outputs to be continuous, you know, spanning the entire real line, then perhaps this activation would be a simple identity function. If you were doing a classification task, I'll show examples of it very soon. Right? If you're doing a classification task, and if it's a binary classification task, meaning you have only two class labels, zero or one, plus one or minus one, this output node could actually have an activation function, which, you know, outputs the probability of classification. So in which case, some kind of, you know, nonlinear activation is applied on the output on this aggregation. Is that clear? Yes? Oh, well, very good question, right? So, uh, so the current um, modern networks are, the deeper you go, the better it is. So the answer to that question would be more in terms of your practical limitations, the hardware limitations that you have, how much does it allow? How many layers does it allow? Because the theory says, sorry, training data, of course. So the connection is the following, right? If you have deep networks, what does it mean? It means you are able to represent a very complex nonlinear function. But how many parameters do you have to learn? It starts increasing as you go deeper, right? So if you actually have to learn, say, millions and millions of parameters, you would also need good amount of data so that the model does not overfit. The model does not memorize your input. So typically we say that the network capacity is determined in terms of the number of parameters of the network. The higher the model capacity, the model can learn more. It is probably a deeper network, but with very limited amount of data, a high capacity network would probably be the, just memorizing your data, resulting in very poor performance. When I say performance, we always measure it in terms of data that was not shown to the model during the training phase, right? 
what are your students you should know this very well right if i as an instructor tell you i'm giving you a set of questions and answers i'm going to ask the same questions during your test i mean where is your i'm, I'm only going to measure your memorizing capability not your understanding of the subject but what does an instructor do gives you a set of questions probably a set of answers but the question that you see in the question paper is something which you have never seen before and that is where we are actually measuring how good is your understanding of the subject the same thing applies to neural networks as well or for that matter any machine learning algorithm you would want to measure the goodness of the model on unseen data right okay yeah so this is an example of a two layer feed forward network yes no the outputs are the class labels themselves very soon you will see how do i represent the class labels because if 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 as we discussed before i was saying the class labels i mean the outputs are basically symbols right what does it mean to say they are symbols how can we represent those symbols we'll see that very soon uh those are not the hyperplanes the weights together put together that will represent your hyperplane so you have different hyperplanes here each z here actually corresponds to a different hyperplane and that that is characterized by this set of weights w it is it is strictly not a hyperplane because to get z you are also applying this nonlinear activation if you were to restrict yourself to only the linear aggregation part yes then it is a hyperplane yes and each z is looking at you know perhaps different parts of the data different parts of the input space and trying to characterize it so it's very hard actually interpret what z refers to okay all right so how much time do i have oh i don't have time okay all right so i'll stop i'll continue ha huh. okay any questions ha uh, i showed the sigmoid there ha uh. i will i will explain it very soon so the traditionally we used to have sigmoid activation so when i did when i learned neural networks when i programmed neural networks to do this digit classification i used sigmoid activation but there is an inherent problem with sigmoid activations and these days we use something called relu rectified linear units i'll talk about it very soon but that that is a very critical aspect because it is this activation function which is introducing non linearity to your network otherwise it would be, i mean let me just complete with this particular slide i think this is very critical so what do you see here my output is basically a what 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 do you see this it is f2 of f1 of f0 of something so basically what is it it is a function composition right it is basically a function composition of the input and that functions are parameterized by these weights and the choice of activation function okay all right i'll stop here any more questions ha huh. each set in the layer layer looks at different parts of the data or some something like that you said no can you explain that so again? what i meant is so if you were to look at each z edge it has a linear path to it of combining these inputs using certain set of weights and then applying an activation function on it right what are these weights well it is learned 
through the training process. But what I was hinting at is perhaps each of these activations, the hidden activations, are looking at different regions in the input space and trying to understand how to process the data in that input space, region in the input space. Input space means the inputs are the same for all the set, right? Yeah, it's a d-dimensional vector, right? Yes. Right, so these weights might be such that Right, um, okay. they uh, they are they get the the z edge gets activated for a certain part of the input space. For the rest, it becomes zeros. I mean, it's very hard to characterize, you know, uh, exactly what z is learning. Okay. It is not possible to. I mean, it's very difficult to characterize what z is learning. But um, to give you an example, using the XOR function, you can think of the intermediate layers to be so if I were to look at the XOR function, right? So this two are zeros and this is plus. Perhaps the Z is looking at this line which separates this data point from the rest and another Z is looking at this line, which separates this point from the rest. Now you can think of one, another node, which is looking at the outputs of these two, combining them together to say that if it is this side of this line, and if it is this side of this line, then it belongs to the zero class. That's what I was trying to do. In what sense optimum? What, what optimum are we referring to? Each Z, I would imagine, I would envision it as some latent representation of the data. That's how I would characterize it. Perfect. So that was my next slide. And this is of no value to us. I mean, if you're only going to have a function compositions of linear function, then basically it is a single linear function and that's not something you're really interested in. You're right. You had, let's say, ZI and ZJ, yeah. that if they had the same connections to the huh. input, would the... Uh, then Why the would, outputs will be the same, yeah, Assume, the, assuming that the activation functions are the same. Uh -huh. So you need to decide which is connected to what, no? Like you need to... Uh, you, uh, you don't have to explicitly decide that. You just connect all the inputs and let the model learn. How does it learn? That we will see very soon. I get your point. What you're saying is, if this is ZH, to what all inputs should be, be connected? That's your question, right? Well, we will go with the least constrained situation. We'll say it is connected to every input and we give it the full freedom to figure out what connections it want to retain. And what connection it want to retain will depend upon the magnitude of W, right? So we can let W to be, you know, span the entire real line. Yep. Maybe this will be explained later, but if you give them all identical connections to begin with. Ha, and that's a same. very good question. If you were to assume that the weights are all identical for all the nodes initially, can the network learn something? We'll come to that very soon. Okay. Any other questions? I hope you're still with me. I, I don't speak your language. Hope you learn my language through this lecture and work with other machine learning researchers to help you with your work. That, that is the motivation for this set of talk. Okay.